Hello there. Good evening, everyone. How are you doing? Depending on where you are, the weather is probably either super hot or if you're in Bangalore, you're probably in the middle of a extremely romantic uh, Uti kind of weather. I'm right now in Mumbai and uh, welcome to the 35th episode of Employee Engagement Live. Uh, we have a very, very interesting guest. It's going to be great fun, great conversations are going to happen today. Uh, so before I invite him, I want to take a quick minute to tell you about uh, why I do this employee engagement live now. About two years back, hell broke loose and uh, the, the work from home was a new thing. Everybody uh, had to work remotely. Had, there was remote working, pandemic, hybrid working, quarantine. These are all new words we, we heard about. And one thing which happened for certain is that employee engagement took a nosedive. Uh, employee engagement has been a very, very important topic for, for uh, quite a few years now. And there were certain standard practices, some good, uh, good uh, case studies that were there around, around different industries, different organizations. But with work from home, a lot of companies started to struggle with engaging their employees. Because of the kind of business that I'm in, I had the opportunity to work closely and uh, monitor, work, watch and um, engage with some of the leaders, business leaders of large organizations. And I started to have conversations with them. And that's how Employee Engagement Live was born. Today is the 35th episode of Employee Engagement Live. And the idea is to help organizations, medium, large or small, to be able to uh, engage their employees better in a more meaningful way in a remote working environment, hybrid working environment, or we don't know what kind of environment we're going to see in the coming months and years. So stay glued. Let me uh, tell you a little bit about the uh, about the guest that we have today. Today we have Sahil Nair. Sahil is the Senior Associate Director at KPMG. He's been with the organization for about 12 long uh, years. He's a behavior scientist, design thinker, human storyteller, and building an employer brand, leading and engaging high performance teams are his biggest strengths. So with that, please help me welcome Sahil. Good evening, Sahil. How are you doing today? Hey, Srikant. Good evening. So nice to be with you today on this lovely Friday afternoon. Awesome. Awesome. Great to have you. So let me ask you the first question that I ask every guest who comes on my show, Sahil. What, according to you, is employee engagement? Well, I think that's a lovely question to start off with. Of course, the devil is always in the basics. So let me tell you what not is employee engagement. And I think... Uh, Rangoli making competition that HR is generally very, very famous for as part of employee engagement is definitely not employee engagement. Uh, I think for the longest time, we've been uh, event planners, we've been event organizers, we've been multiple other roles that we play. But I think fundamentally in this new world with hyper personalization, with a space where we're talking about uberization of talent i think engagement has a lot of hidden tenets that actually need to be touched upon as you really engage with your workforce and some of them it's in the opening question i can share with you are underlying principles of trust because if there's no trust if there is no empathy if there is no connect then all of this may just seem like song and dance, right? If you, if you go back to the Western world, they really find it very difficult that why does Bollywood have so many songs and so many people dancing around trees? Because they don't see the connect, right? You see a matrix and suddenly you see, you know, a you know, lady in a nice, beautiful yellow sari dancing around the tree and water falling and all of that. They find it very bizarre because it's completely out of place. And in many Bollywood movies, we've also found songs that have been placed that just don't fit into the whole storyline. Therefore, in summary, engagement is key, but engagement needs to be done from here. Mm -hmm. It has to have that connect. It has to have empathy. It has to have trust. And it has to be more than just being ceremonial on festivals. It's a great opportunity to connect with people, but it just can't be about celebrating festivals or rangoli making competitions. Awesome, awesome. You you nailed it in the head and a great way to start with what is not employee engagement. I'm, I'm absolutely certain this is going to be a great conversation. So I want to take a minute to welcome the uh, welcome the visitors that we have. 
Uh, thank you so much. It's a Friday evening. There are a hundred other things that you could be doing. Really appreciate you taking your time off and being here. Keep your pen and paper handy because you're going to come across some amazing golden nuggets. So with that said, Sahil, um, you said Uberization of talent. Can you explain what you mean by that? No, I think fundamentally what's happening is, Srikant, we've seen this in multiple generations or I may say decades, right? We've seen a time when it was industrial revolution. We've seen a time where you moved away from an employer's market to an employee's market. We've seen a time when it went back to the employer's market and an employer would call the shots. And post the great resignation, we're actually back in that same space of it being an employee's market. Mm -hmm. On one hand, we see people who don't have jobs. They've lost their jobs during COVID. On the other hand, you see at the other end of the spectrum, people are actually moonlighting. They have more than one or two or three jobs. And the benefit of working from home is you just put four laptops alongside each other and keep working and doing whatever you're doing. And, you know, you're managing in the way you're managing. Ethical, not ethical, we won't get there, but people are doing that. Now, the whole question is, when you talk about Uberization of talent, and this is the point that we need to pause and reflect. If we say ethically moonlighting is wrong, do we as India Inc. have the courage to embrace the gig workforce? Because the moment I legalize moonlighting, I'm essentially saying you're a gig worker. You spend so many hours with me. You do well. I pay you for the outcome. And you can do this across industries, of course. You know, confidentiality and data privacy laws need to be respected. We need to take care of that piece. But apart from that, I think what's wrong in that? The person's really earning different sources of income. You're getting your outcomes. You're creating the impact. And the person's willing to use his or her time to the best of their opportunity and availability. And therefore, in this whole concept of hyper-personalization and uberization of talent, I think fundamentally it's a two-way street. It is no longer that I'm just paying for the cab and I can behave the way I want in the cab. Because if I'm going to get drunk and I'm going to dirty the cab because I've had too much of alcohol, the driver is going to give me a bad rating. And it doesn't stop there. If the driver gives me a bad rating and I consistently get poor ratings from the driver, it's going to impact me in two ways. One, when there is surge, and when there is a lot of demand with limited supply, I'll be the last one to get a cab. Number two, even if I get a cab, I will pay double of what you would pay, Srikant, because your rating is very good. And now you see how this plays out? From a driver and a consumer perspective, just draw an analogy to say, oh, there is an employer and an employee perspective. While we do have a Sybil score, for our financial needs, we are waiting. And I am very keenly looking forward to this. Where is the employee score? We all talk about saying, oh, you've taken an offer and you reject it on the last day or on the date of joining, there's a no-show. Just think of this. Imagine if we had a repository of actually holding people accountable to professional standards of being, and each one of us had a score. And that score would play a very important parameter in our employment. I think that is where we look at the future. Sorry, long answer to a short question, but I wanted to give a holistic perspective. No, I think that was a fantastic analogy. Easy, made it easy for a lot of people to understand. And I'm, and I'm sure some of the things which you said, especially about moonlighting and, and make, making moonlighting legal could be music to so many ears. Uh, so let's let's wait and watch if uh, what's going to happen and... You know, I'm, I'm expecting this year there might be some changes in the laws with respect to uh, working from home remotely, the leave policies, all of those kind of things. I think there might be revision. So let's wait and watch what happens. Uh, so let's, you spoke about the great resignation and I've gone through your LinkedIn profile. There are quite a few um, posts that you've written about the great resignation and, and some of them are really, really hilarious about, you know, how, how to get people back. So my question to you here is what what what's going on why do organizations want employees to come back is that necessary if if it is necessary what is the right method or the right strategy to bring them back 
No, I think uh, that's a very powerful question because it has a lot of sub questions bundled up in it. But let me try and answer that. I've written a lot about this, as you rightly mentioned on LinkedIn. Uh, but a couple of thoughts there, right? I think the first one very clearly is geography is now history, right? <laughs> and I'm going to repeat that. Geography <laughs> is now history. Because I remember a time, and I'm sure many of us and many of your viewers who are going to be listening in and tuned in and listening in right now live will agree with me that there was a time when managers would actually fight with HR or admin to say, this person is joining my team, ensure that this person gets a seat right outside my cabin. Right? And that was the mindset. And then when you moved into a hub and spoke model, you wanted people to be in the same office that you were in so you could keep... a tab on what the person's doing, what's the person not doing, how long is the sutta break, who are they hanging out with, who do they go and gossip at the gop, you know, at the water cooler with, all of those things, right? COVID happened, we all are working from home, right? Most of us, of course, there are many industries where people, you know, manufacturing, you can't work from home, aviation, you can't work from home, right? So I'm just generalizing but i'm saying majority of the people have either found their sweet spot or at least i can talk about professional services uh, and the big four we're all you know we're working from home or the client side in that space i think two things have happened which are fundamental shifts one the mindset has moved away or at least i would choose to believe is moving away from input to output it doesn't matter how many hours you're spending. It doesn't matter how much of effort you're putting. As long as you're achieving the output or the outcome or creating an impact, that is important. Yeah. We've really seen and friends across industries in the HR space I've been speaking with have told me people have gone and moved to the hills. They're staying in Manali, right? People are sitting in Goa by the beach. They log off at six o'clock. They have their beers they log back in at 10 o'clock and start working, right? So people have chosen to either go back to their hometowns and do farming with their parents. Some people have chosen to do and do staycations. And some people have said, you know what? I have a house in Ranchi. Why do I need to stay in Bombay and pay such crazy rent when I can achieve the same thing from Ranchi, right? Yeah. Fundamentally, if geography has become history, if our metric has moved away from input, I need to see what you're doing to mm -hmm. show me the results, which is the output. And the third most important aspect is we allow people to be who they are rather than force fit them into what we want them to be, right? We will see fundamentally, Shrikant, what happens? We create rules in every organization. We create rules for the 20% of the people who don't follow them sure. as compared to the 80% who do follow them. Absolutely. And therefore, the 80%, going back to your point on engagement, get disengaged because sure. they want to be treated like adults. And they say, listen, why are you treating me like a child and saying, oh, this is a policy, this is a rule. I'm an adult. Treat me like an adult. But because of that 20% yeah. who play around, who manipulate, we create rules for 100%. Right? <laughs> Now, coming to your second part of your question, coming back to work. For all those people who got used to sitting in their pajamas and in their shorts and reclining and actually taking a break between two calls, maybe just taking a quick nap or watching a series on Netflix or actually doing a little bit of household chores, and they can do all of that, right? Because earlier, if you had to really go and get your car repaired, you had to take a half-day leave. If you had to do some bank work, you have to take leave. But yeah. now between two calls, people just walk down to their bank, they sort their bank work out, come back before the next call. So that flexibility is brilliant as long as it's not being misused. And therefore, at least what I have been doing with my team is, the rule is very simple. You're welcome. In fact, you're encouraged to come to work to only do those things that you can't do from home. Because imagine if I'm going to call my team to office and get them to be on those same teams and same Zoom calls, which they are at home, they're going to say, listen, why do I travel two hours? Correct. It makes no logical sense. So we actually catch up in office once a week, once in 10 days to celebrate. 
to be there with each other, to have knowledge sharing sessions, to be in person, brainstorm idea, because I'm old school. And I think the marker and the, the whiteboard and sitting together and putting your hand around someone's shoulder is a lot more fun than all the scribbles on Zoom, which are there as post-its, virtual post-its, right? So I think brainstorming, ideation, innovation, celebrating success, rewarding team members and finally at the end of a lovely friday going out and having a beer together right is the best way to catch up in office for things that otherwise you can't do at home but for everything else in a model that works and i'm sure different industries and different organizations have different ways of looking at it but in a model that works if you can do things from home why not yeah Absolutely. I think you answered my question half there. So I get what you're doing with your team, right? But but we are hearing across across the board that organizations are asking. Today morning or yesterday, I read an article on DNA which said 800 employees of an organization resigned because they were asked to uh, report to office within the next one month. Let's not talk about the organization name. But even, even if there is little merit to that report, uh, it, it, it's giving a certain indication. There is probably a rift between what employees want because in the early days when when the pandemic started, people wanted to come back to office. They didn't want to sit in. But now the situation is very, very, like people are in Manali and in Goa. So why are organizations calling calling them back? Why are why is it being made compulsory? So I think I didn't answer it explicitly. I was more implicit. Maybe now I'll be a lot more explicit, uh, Shikant. I think very simple, right? The rule is for 100% because 20% mm. don't follow. Right. Now the 20% who are sitting at home, there is a segment and 20 could be 15, 10 based on the organization, but Mota Moti, 20% are actually misusing work from home. Correct. Wi-Fi not connecting, uh, mm -hmm. I don't have network, oh, I'll mm -hmm. come back, not joining calls, not giving results. Yeah. So that's not happening. And therefore, people are saying, you know what, let's go back to the old model of command and control. Right. As compared to empower and let people do what they have to do. Right. That's one. Second yeah. is look at it from an employee standpoint, right? You're go back to what I said earlier. You're in an employee market. Mm. Now, today, if you're going to get me out of my comfort zone, which is sitting in the comfort of my house with, you know, a very nice air conditioning, with my mother giving me lovely food to eat whenever I want. And we've seen a lot of WhatsApp videos where the guy is sitting in office and saying, Mommy, chai. And they're like 100 people looking at him saying, what's wrong with you, right? So if all of that is happening, and then you're going to tell me, Sahil, travel two hours in this lovely weather that you spoke about. Uh, I'm going to say, listen, but why? Mm, correct. And unless managers are not able to answer this question of why do you need to travel two hours to be in office, you will see resistance because it is basic yeah. human nature of the law of inertia. <laughs> I'm not saying it. It's the law of inertia. right? Yeah. And therefore, it's going to be basic human resistance. Now, you may go back to command and control and say, you know what, but I am your boss and I am telling you, you need to come to office. Mm. I will say, okay. He'll start giving interviews. She'll give interviews. A month later, I'll say, you are my boss. Please take my resignation letter. <laughs> as simple as that, right? Yeah. And therefore, going back to my earlier point of engagement, engagement is about having those empathetic conversations to say, yeah. you tell me, are you productive at home? Mm -hmm. Many times we take this for granted to say people have nice big houses and a room to themselves and they can work peacefully. The reality is, and I've done that myself with a couple of colleagues to say, you know what? You tell me, do you find it difficult to work from home? You have a small house. On the other hand, the TV is on, your dad's aging, you're sitting there, you're trying to take care of stuff. You're also making food, you're serving food. While all of that is great, is it really that you're being honest to the job that you've been hired for? Are you doing 100% justice to your potential? And when you have such kind of conversations, people sit back and reflect saying, you know what, I think I've pushed my limits way too far with this work from home. Let me start going to office one, two days a week and let me get used to that because at the end of the day, I'm getting a salary and I need to earn that salary. Now, that's very different from telling a colleague saying, you know what, you're not performing and you're not working. And every time I call you, you're not available. You don't pick up my call. You're not working. Come to office. What's right. going to be the response? Defense mechanism. 
yeah. versus an exploratory conversation to say, you tell me what works for you. Yeah. Awesome. I think you you demonstrated, you explained it very, very uh, beautifully. It's uh, it, it's going to be a wait and watch game. How many people are able to have that bandwidth and ability to have such meaningful conversations? Uh, but I think where where you are uh, kind of indicating is it's 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 going to start working as uh, you should stop looking at one organization as a large organization with the thousands of employees and start looking at it as uh, smaller teams with 15, 20, 50 people and. Uh, the leadership within those teams drives the policies within those uh, within those teams. That's what I'm hearing. Is that is that correct? No, you're absolutely right, Srikant. But one of the pitfalls that we need to be very, very conscious of as leaders is to say these micro teams shouldn't start creating their micro cultures. Mm. Because at the end of the day, an organization has a culture and that fabric has to be a fabric that cuts across all teams. Right. Otherwise, what you'll end up seeing is that you will see these micro cultures that start getting formed and will start flourishing. And then that could actually come at a cost. I need 20 minutes. 20. Sorry. No, no worries. Yeah, please, please continue, sorry. No, so I was just saying that, uh, you know, you're absolutely right, but we just need to be conscious of the fact that we don't allow these micro cultures to get yes. formed. Yeah, absolutely. So that's a, Are you that's comfortable a, with the place. I think so. You, someone had requested, stepped in to say they need the space. I think I'm going to stay here for some time. <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> they come and go here. <laughs> so, uh, so absolutely, that, that, that's that chicken and egg situation, right? Do you, do you, build cultures and do you say policies and everything at, with the bigger picture? How do you balance that out? How do you give that freedom and flexibility for uh, small teams? And especially we're looking at um, there, there is there is a lot of acquisition of smaller startups, which is happening. So there are people coming from smaller startups where the work culture was very, very different. You probably would would have been bags and wearing Bermudas to office and things like that to organizations where you wear uh, full sleeve shirts and ties, right? So, so how do you build that mix? How do you, where do you draw the line? How much flexibility can you give to a small team uh, to make sure that those teams are engaged in a meaningful way while not diluting the, uh, the bigger picture and the culture of the organization? I think Shikan, very good point. And this is obviously that catch 22, right? Uh, yeah. How do you really manage it? What, how much is enough, right? Mm -hmm. Because how much is enough? And I think I, I recall a conversation that I was having with a friend of mine, uh, an ex-CHRO. Uh, and uh, she was telling me that once upon a time, she was actually uh, entasked with the responsibility to change the dress code policy of her organization. Right. Uh, and this takes me back to the time when she said, you know what, Sahil, and I, as a lady, I was thinking, what choices of words? With, with men, it's very easy, right? It's a shirt, pant, yeah. you have bermudas, you have a tie, whatever, whatever. But with women with the kind of wardrobes that they have, it's so difficult to really list down everything of what is okay, not okay, and all of that. And uh, she said, I just made a very simple policy. She changed a two-pager dress code policy into one line and said, dress as if you are the brand ambassador of your organization. Awesome. As simple as that. And this goes back to my earlier point of saying, treat adults like adults. Yeah. Now, if you think wearing shorts and walking into office when there's a client is acceptable, then maybe you're not at the right organization, <laughs> right? If you think you're coming for a fashion show when you're actually coming to work, maybe you're not at the right organization, right? If you know that you can always overdress and then get the jacket off as compared to not being appropriately dressed, then maybe you're, you're not grown up to be an adult. And I think some of these points are very reflective of the way you start treating adults like adults. And they love it that way. You don't need to get very prescriptive of what is okay and what is not okay. Right. Absolutely. Perfect. So let's, the title of today's uh, today's um, uh, interview is, is, is about the role of CSR, Corporate Social Responsibility, in employee engagement. Can you tell me a little bit about your thoughts on that? Sure. So I think, Shrikan, let me go back in time. Um, when I joined my current organization, uh, at that point of time, there were a lot of emails that we would get about CSR activities and initiatives. 
and i used to keep wondering i said wow this organization really invests in giving back to communities and i said okay let me just start attending a few events let me tell you shrikant the first one or two events i was just a simple observer seeing what's happening how are people talking to each other such a huge organization uh with different service lines different functions and then i said wow this is so beautiful because think of it this way right from the junior most person to the senior most person mm-hmm. in various forms and shapes people were made there they were available right so in an organization like a big four you could actually get up and talk to a partner who mm-hmm. otherwise sahil may not have ever done in his life because if i didn't have worked with a certain individual it would not really warrant me to go and walk up to someone and randomly say hi how are you my name is sahil i wouldn't do that right, right. because maybe that's just not me right because it's such a huge organization different departments different levels so on and so forth but i said csr events were such a beautiful platform outside of work where you could actually connect with people on a common purpose mm. because yeah. people are actually coming to an event to maybe plant trees mm. or to maybe contribute to go and teach underprivileged children and we do so much of these right and i said yeah. wow this is a space where a bunch of 40 50 people across service lines across designations across hierarchy across various skill sets across mm. various education qualifications because if i am a chartered accountant i would be a ca working in audit or tax if i am a guy who done an mba from an iim ahmedabad i could be part of the consulting division if i am an engineer from iit kharagpur i could be there and i said this is a brilliant place to get to know people to make friends and to learn yeah and these are the three top ups and i would say the word top up because we're in the world of healthcare and you know insurance premiums and top ups and i said this would be a top up in addition to contributing to the common cause that is bringing all of us together to give back to our communities and i can tell you shrikant the friends you make outside of work are the ones who help you when you do work awesome the same relationships that you've invested in that you really built friends at csr events when you come back and have a work call there is automatically an association there is automatically a connect oh sahil i met you there you know it was a great fun last time we met we haven't caught up for so long but tell me how can i help you now right and right. that bond is already established and i said this is like a win win because i'm committed to the cause of csr which is yes. why i'm going there i'm able to make friends i'm able to actually learn from other people and their experiences i'm able to know what they are doing in their service lines or their businesses with their clients and therefore um, you know a lot more well read well received well networked if i may use that word and ultimately when i have to really connect with someone for a certain purpose or certain work these relationships are actually very very helpful yeah absolutely i think those are some amazing amazing statements you made you you, you spoke about uh you know i love the uh, line where you said geography is now history absolutely agree with you i think the world is truly becoming flat whether you are in bangalore or bagalpur chennai or chandigarh doesn't matter where you are the opportunities are are very very uh similar for you and 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 this thing which you said about building connections outside of work i think that is that is phenomenal and i think that is the part which is getting missed out when you're not coming to office being the ability or the opportunity to build real meaningful connections and that's also the reason why i think because because you're not when you're working remotely and and in the last 2 3 years i mean i'm guessing at least 50% of people have changed jobs and they're not emotionally invested in that organization or with that team so it's very easy for them to just send out a resignation it's you know you don't have to think so hard saying hey i have a good friend here i'll miss that person out or uh you know any of those kind of things anyway i'm sitting on, in my room in front of my laptop the laptop will change no big deal right so that's that's i think uh, going to be a big loss and like what you rightly said it's up to the managers to show enough value in in uh coming to the office and and very difficult for a large organization to say hey this is the new policy and no matter what you need to do it then like you said it's going to have repercussions in the form of 
resignation, the great resignation. Mr. Chikhal, in fact, oh. I, really liked, I really liked what you said, right? A lot of people who have been uh, with organizations for a long point in time actually find this as one of the factors that really holds them back. Because they've built friends there, they've built family there, they've actually gone out and got such close people who are part of their network that, you know what, they work with them every day and therefore work feels like home. Mm -hmm. Now, when you have all those associations over the years that you built, that also plays a very important factor when you want to switch your job. But now, if all of that is completely missing, as you rightly said, very easy to just say, you know what, I'm not even feeling belongingness in this yeah. organization. I don't feel as if I belong here because I hardly know anybody. People have joined remotely and people have left also remotely. They haven't even experienced the fabric of the Correct. organization, right? Correct. Correct. Absolutely. You know, you know I, I've seen people when they resign, I've seen people who cried saying this was really home to me and I'm, I'm I, there is remorse, there is, uh, I won't say regret, but they have to move on, but there is a very strong emotional connect. That, that's completely missing out. And uh, I think with the introduction of the metaverse, it will create an opportunity for you to all get together and have virtual beers together. So that's going to make these things even more difficult. Or, or, or I think time will tell a little bit. Any thoughts you have on metaverse and have you started experimenting with metaverse at your organization? No, I think that's a space that we would definitely want to do a lot more. Of course, we've started off, we've started experimenting. We do a lot of stuff for our clients in that space. Uh, but I think, uh, to be very honest, hand on heart, I want to just give it a little bit of time to try and wait and watch. To say, is it just another fad mm. or is it here to stay? Mm. We've seen a lot of uh, such technologies that have come in as fads. Right. And they've come for a season and then they've vanished into thin air. And there right. have been certain technologies that people have just latched on to because of right. the value that has got created. So I think that's only a matter of time till yeah. we'll get to know how things play out. It's a very fancy buzzword, right? But if you ask people, tell me more and you just scratch the surface a bit to say, okay, so what is this metaverse? You'll find a lot of people who really struggle to give right. you the right answer of one, what it is, two, how can they leverage it for their own business? Ideas are galore, but on the ground implementation and ability to know the nuts and bolts, I think people are still figuring it out. Yeah, absolutely. So we have Kripali Parmar and Girija Shetty and Shivani Malhotra who, who have some nice things to say. Thank you so much, guys. If, if any of you have any questions that you want to point out to Sahil, you have another 10, 15 minutes and then we'll be winding up. So while we wait in case we have any questions, uh, there, there was a very important thing that you said. We, you said that the underlying principles of trust uh, are critical to employee engagement. And you spoke about uh, a lot of times uh, creating policies for that 10, 15, 20 percent who are bending the rules and that impacting the larger 90 percent. Right. So um, and, and, and you spoke about leadership changing its mindset from input to output. My question to you is two parts. Right. One is what role or what mindset shift does leadership need to have to be able to have a more engaged uh, workforce, especially in larger organizations uh, like yours? And are they, are they, is this transition happening? Are, are leaders uh, accepting that output is, is okay? I don't, I don't really mind if they, if they have a part-time job or if, if, if they're doing something else uh, in addition to the main job. So I think Srikant, uh, I'll be honest to say we're on a journey. Right. Uh, I don't think we've arrived. We're in the process of arriving. Right. Uh, uh, fundamentally, if you look at this, how does this really play out? This plays out in two, three ways. One, you need to see where is the mind space of the individual. Right. Are you really understanding the way people are thinking, the way people are reacting? Because for the longest time, we have looked at it from, you know, the customer is king. Uh, clients are important, but I think clients and people are two sides of the same coin. Because if you do have clients, but you don't have people to deliver, how are you going to keep the clients happy? Right. And therefore, if clients and people are two sides of the same coin, why is it that we would have different approaches for each of them? Right. If a client is equally important, so are people. If people are facing a burnout, how do you expect them to give you brilliant client service? 
And this is very, very true for many other organizations who are in the same space. And therefore, somewhere we need to pause, think and reflect to say, how do we really get the perfect sweet spot between two conflicting or equally important aspects? Mm-hmm. And I think once you achieve that balance, yeah. you'll not only be in equilibrium, but you'll also be in harmony. Right. Absolutely. I, I hear you. So we're still in the journey and a few more months, few more years, there'll be a little more clarity. Is that what we're saying? Yeah, I think not just clarity, but more importantly, Shrikant, I think appreciation of the fact that you're not just working with a pair of hands. Mm. Yeah, You're not just working with a brilliant mind that can work on models and churn out macros and beautiful Power BI dashboards. You're Good. actually working with a human who also has a heart who also has emotions, who also wants to express, who also wants to feel valued, and who also wants to feel rewarded and respected. And I think fundamentally, when the mind shift happens in that manner, holistically, you will see that appreciation for both aspects that we spoke about earlier will be a lot higher. Awesome. Perfect. So uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, um, uh, talent brand building or employer brand building. So what what is this? I, 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 we've heard that word uh, uh, quite a bit. So tell me what is employer brand building and why is it important? And you know, if you had to say these are the three most important things to do in that space, what would those be? Got it. Uh, I think it's a matter of time. And the reason why I say it's a matter of time is because if you were in an employer's market and I had to actually come and tell you, Shrikant, why don't you put aside so much money for employer branding or for recruitment marketing? You would come back and ask me, Sahil, but what's the need? I have enough people applying to my organization. In fact, people are dying to work with me. I don't have that as a problem. I have a good brand. People talk well about me. My clients are very happy with my delivery. So why do you want me to spend so many thousands of dollars on recruitment marketing? Right. And therefore, as I always say, context is very important. Right. Today, we're not in an employer's market. We're in an employee's market. Right. And therefore, everyone is window shopping. <laughs> now, when people are window shopping, even before they enter your store, they have done their homework. They've already gone on to Glassdoor and Clubhouse and everywhere else in the world to say, oh, forget the organization at an individual manager level. Because at the end of the day, people don't leave organizations, they leave managers. So at an individual manager level, people have got their intelligence to say, oh, working with this guy, brilliant. You will actually learn a lot. Or working with her, She's an amazing boss. You have to have an opportunity at least once in your lifetime to work with her. Or you know what? With this guy, he's going to make your life hell. Don't join him. Don't work in his team. His team attrition has been 80%. Right? And therefore, intelligence anyway is happening. Now, what is recruitment marketing? What is employer branding? Very, very simple. Two schools of thought. There is marketing and there is entire an employer piece or a recruitment piece or a candidate piece, right? You marry the two. It's as simple as that. There's no rocket science. So you bring in the principles of marketing and you bring in the brand, you bring in the organization. And then you ask certain fundamental questions to say, who are we? If I am Apple, who am I? Right? What do I stand for? What differentiates me from my competitors? And most importantly, what is my promise that I'm going to be delivering to every single person out there for which I want to be known as Apple, just as an example, right? Now, all of this can sound like a lot of gyan. So therefore, you need to use the brilliance of marketing to contextualize it to your organization so that it resonates with the employee, with the candidate sitting out there. Many a time, Shrikan, many organizations get this completely wrong. Why? Because they go out there on social media and do a great sham, do a great bang marketing, right? 
a brilliant marketing campaign. And employees in the organization sit back and they may not say it because they might be scared, but they actually think and they have those corridor conversations and they have those water cooler conversations saying, you saw that in the newspaper. Where is it? I don't know about it. This is, is that a policy that we have? Oh, I didn't know. Right? And they, they get to know from outside. And therefore, equity between internal and external is very, very important. I think coming back to you, the third part of your question, the three things that one should definitely do as you build an employer brand, and I spoke of one of them very subtly, but I'll call it out explicitly, is to be authentic and genuine. Unless you're not authentic, if you don't walk the talk and if you don't talk the walk, both in perfect tandem, you're going to have a problem because you're going to see dissonance that will start creeping in, right? Mm -hmm. Second, you may be authentic, you may be genuine, but you have to have a great balance between form and substance. Mm -hmm. right? We've seen the best cricketers in the world have amazing substance, but they've been off form for very long and then they get dropped off, right? How do you have the perfect balance between form and substance and balance it out? And the third most important thing, how do you go to the right target audience? Because if you're going to go and sell ice to an Eskimo, now you may say, oh, but Sahil, give me 10 ways to sell ice to an Eskimo. But well, that's not your objective, guys. Let's get it very clear. You got to sell eyes to the guy who is making that gola and yeah. it's going to give you that gola, that kala katta gola or that nimbu pani wala gola that you love having when the temperature touches 45 degrees. Right. That's the guy who needs the best quality eyes where you know that gala kharab nahi hoga. Now, if you're going to go and say, no, but sell eyes to an Eskimo, how's it going to help? Yeah? It's not going to help. Yeah. Right? So you have to have that perfect blend of eyes crushed beautifully that when you have that gola, or when you have that kala katta wala gola, dil khush ho chai, gala bhi nahi So those are my couple of points on the truth. Spot on, spot on. So three points I made note, be authentic and be genuine. Uh, no point in, in, in uh, you know, faking it till you make it kind of a thing that this, it's gonna, not going to serve any purpose. Balance between form and substance. And most importantly, go to the right target audience. I think the, the last part which you said is, I think, is absolute gold. Uh, because, uh, you know, I, I come across these questions saying we, we tend to generalize, right? And nowadays, everybody wants to go to startups. Nowadays, uh, the, the Gen Z is not loyal. Or nowadays, this is, we tend to generalize this. I don't think you can generalize any segment or anything at all. There is, there is uh, you know, for, for every rule there is a, there is an exception and to be able to identify that exact target audience who who fits into your culture who has the kind of right right ethic uh, you know who who fits who's looking for exactly what you have to offer is the key and i think that is the biggest um, biggest point that you that you mentioned no point in if i'm a small organization i have to highlight what it is that i can offer vis-a-vis -a, -vis a large what a large organization can offer and there are takers for both is what i what i believe yeah, and I think Shikant, you made a nice point which I would like to pick as a leaf. Generalization is the biggest mistake that we can make, right? You mentioned in the start in my introduction, 12 years with an organization being a millennial myself. I actually wrote an article called saying paradoxically millennial, right? Okay. I didn't call it accidental because it's not accidental. I know there are a lot of movies made on the accidental so-and-so, but paradoxically millennial. You know, because it's not that millennials keep changing jobs every three months or every six months. That's generalizing. And I think fundamentally, we should never do that. Yeah, absolutely. So we're at the fag end of our, of our episode. And I want to ask you uh, one last question. You spoke about uh, asking uh, employees to dress like their brand ambassadors of the organization. Right. So what according to you is a brand ambassador of an organization and what can organizations do? to genuinely give them an opportunity to become brand ambassadors of the organization. So Shrikant, I know this has been a slightly tit-a-tat kind of conversation. Let me flip this question back to you and let's reverse roles. <laughs> you lead a wonderful organization, right? It's your organization. You tell me how many Shrikants do you have in your organization? And that is what I mean by brand ambassador. How many right. people see things exactly the way you see it? How many people have the same fire in the belly just the way you have it. 
and how many people are saying doesn't matter whether it's bombay today or it's bangalore tomorrow if i need to be at a particular expo which you were at yesterday i will be there because my brand needs to be there good word right and the day every single employee has the same qualities i think yeah. no organization can really be in a space that would be unstoppable absolutely unstoppable the only question is how do you bring in that founder startup feeling ki ye mera bachcha hai this is my organization shivani has joined us and i know she's live with us positive yeah. vibes consulting right good yes. friend of mine brilliant right how does she look at it every single team member on her team says positive vibes positive vibes positive vibes yeah. and we have so many examples out there the real question is how do you infuse the same level of josh the same level of jazba and the same level of junoon josh jazba junoon in yeah. every single employee so that yeah. they can go out there and say i don't work for this organization i am this organization fantastic that is fundamentally you know it just comes out in your voice right yeah. it just comes out in your voice because you are living the brand as yeah. compared to saying i am associated with this brand mm-hmm. right absolutely i think that's really well said and 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 the you know put me in a spot flipping that question uh so and often it's i i take absolute pride in in saying we've been touch wood lucky and uh we we've been able to build a phenomenal team and um uh my take on that is uh kind of inspired from um, i think a book written by i forget the name of the author it says employees first customer second something like that right uh i think it's the um founder of hcl who wrote uh, neet nair wrote that from hcl who, who wrote that book so it's 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 empowering the the uh, employees showing them the respect giving them the opportunity so our work culture is built at often it's our work culture is built around these four things work hard learn grow have fun these are the four things everything that we do revolves around that and uh, we look for people who align with these four things during the interview and once we do that and once the culture is automatically aligned there is a lot of transparency a lot of opportunity i think the rest is will look like magic to outsiders but it is uh, i think it's uh, built on the foundation of this work culture which is what i think super all right thank you thank you so much sahil it was fantastic speaking to you thank you so much uh, uh, there's so many great uh, takeaways that i had from this from this interview thank you so much for your time i hope you had a good time sahil absolutely it was a pleasure being with you shrikant thank you for having me over Awesome. Thank you. And thank you so much everyone in the audience for taking your time off and joining. See you again in the next episode. Bye-bye.